Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How are you? Hey, y'all give them a hand. Amen. That's our, that's our peeps right there, amen, and they've been trained and they've been put into this, and uh, man, I'm excited to see what they're doing. Hey, have you ever had a conversation with somebody um, that maybe they ask you a question like, hey, what is your view on this? And then they, you give them your view and they go, huh, I don't think I agree with that. Or may, may, maybe you're asking somebody and, and you're going to them and going, hey, hey, I'm just, I'm more, what, what do you think about this? And, and they give you a response and you go, huh, I don't think I agree with that. So here's what I've learned in 30 years of ministry is that majority of the people that come to me, the majority of people that come for counseling, and by the way, I'm not a counselor, okay? I don't have a degree in counseling. I've just, I've learned that people screw up and I screw up and I've learned how to really screw up, not really know how to fix it, amen? So I, I get all that, but here's what I've learned. Most people that come, I'm not the first counselor they've come to, right? Uh, many times they've already gone to a professional counselor or they already put a poll out on Facebook or, or, or asking, hey, what do you think, right? And, and they've got all this and they're finally coming to me and they're going, okay, I've asked this question. My mama told me, my daddy told me, my wife, my husband, my kids, my cousin, uh, my, my four pastors before you. And so really, really, really what I wanna know is, well, you'll agree with what I already think, right? And that's what I found out. And see, many of us do that with God, don't we? Many of us do that with God is we don't really like what he tells us to do or we really don't like his prescription to our solution. And so what we do is we switch gods. We just switch gods. And so we just come along and go, well, I don't like what you have to say, so I wanna go over here and spend money like Danielle was talking. I'm gonna go over here and change the way I feel. And really what we're doing is we're just kind of switching gods. We go from God, who maybe is a little more convenient to kind of fit our belief system, to kind of fit our view of life. And we're just looking for a little God that's maybe going to be a little more flexible to our lifestyle and our values and our goals. You see, last week we started this whole conversation about being whole, is that God wants us to be whole when we're in Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, we, we talked last week in Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 37, he says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and spirit, right? And so what that means is that we are created and we are saved. We are spiritual beings. For those of us in the room that call ourselves Christians, for those of us in the room that, that we have the seed of Jesus Christ in us and it should be growing out of us, then there's a spiritual side to that. But we also know that there's these things that many of us struggle with, or maybe I'm the only one, is that we are not only spiritual, we're emotional. Amen? And listen, emotions aren't good or bad, evil or not evil. They just are, right? because we know what loss is, we know what vulnerability is, we know what weakness is, and we know all those things. And they're not good or bad, they just are. You can't trust them unless they line up with the Word of God because we're spiritual first and God wants us to be whole. And then we have this whole idea also is that we are physical. And we know that the physical in, involves the emotional, the emotional involves the physical, and the spiritual drives both. And the only way to get back into balance or what we call wholeness is through 
repentance. And repentance, remember, and metanoia is simply changing your mind to think like God. It involves changing your mind, which will lead to a change of action. So it also has that idea that you're going one way. And once you realize that, hey, physically, emotionally, that, man, something's not lined up, something's not right, that there is a turning of our life back to the Lord Jesus Christ in the spiritual area to be delivered from those things that are no longer working for us. You got any things that's not working for you? Right? And so in our passage today, we find Israel kind of in that place. That we find Israel, as we move on into our names of God, is that Israel is no longer whole. In fact, we find Israel has now been divided into two kingdoms, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And we find in our, in, our, in our passage today in Jeremiah that one has already gone off into slavery. They've totally abandoned God. But we find that the uh, southern, the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom's gone. The southern kingdom has, has still got a chance, okay? they still got a chance. God's warning them in the book of Jeremiah. And if you know anything about the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah is not the most encouraging book you've ever read, okay? Let's just be honest. I told you, sometimes we look at Scripture and we, we get too spiritual. And we just go, oh, I just love the book of Jeremiah. Well, something's wrong with you, okay? Because it's depressing, amen? And it's discouraging, man. And I'm telling you, you can't read this. If you're depressed, don't go to Jeremiah, okay? Go somewhere else. But don't go to Jeremiah. Because what's happening is, is the northern kingdom's gone, the southern kingdom's here, and, 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 and so the southern kingdom is, is about to be cast off into slavery. And Jeremiah is sent, and he's saying, look, man, you got to turn back to God. God is the standard for where you need to be. And so he introduces this name that we find in Jeremiah. is called Jehovah Sidkenu, or Jehovah, the Lord is our righteousness. In other words, he's our standard. He's the one that measures right and wrong. He's the one that measures emotional maturity, physical maturity, and spiritual maturity. It's his standard, not ours. And so we find this in this passage. We learn a fundamental principle through the book of Jeremiah. And it's simply this in Israel history. The further you depart from God, the more you invite decline and degeneration in your life. The further you get away from God's standard, the further you get away from what God thinks, and, and the further you get away of not measuring your own life up against God, the further you invite decline and degeneration in your journey. And some of you are living that right now. And Israel is going after other gods to meet their needs. In other words, they didn't like God's standard. They didn't like what God called them to do. So they just traded in one God for another God. They just traded in one for the other. And the book of Jeremiah details the warning of the judgment that's coming to the Israelites. In Jeremiah 23, verse one, he says, woe to you shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. And so he starts with the shepherds because you gotta understand in, in, in the Israelites' days, religion, God, the sacrificial system, everything in their life revolved around that. Everything revolved around that. Now in our life, your life, maybe in our culture, our life didn't really revolve around that, which may be the problem, amen? But everything revolved on that. So God first starts with the shepherds of who was leading the people, who, who was going to the God's people. And basically what they were doing is they were creating more confusion than clarity. They had no longer raised God's standard or put God's standard or, or, or agreed with God's standard that this is the way life was like. And they were failing miserably. I mean, how would you like that to be your next job review? Whoa, you stink. That's what God did to them. He called them all together. It's okay, boys, we're going to evaluate the last year. I know I gave you some goals last year, and this is what I want you to do, and I want you to raise the standard. And by the way, you stink. In fact, let me go ahead and say this. You're a bunch of failures. Whoa. That's where God is. And so he declares the spiritual leaders of the time, you're failing miserably, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up new leaders. Look at verses 4 through 6. He says, I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and no longer, no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord. And now he's talking, he's, he's looking ahead. The days are coming when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And the days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. 
And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. The word Jehovah, the relator God, and the word Sidkenu, our righteousness. That our relator God determines what's right and what's wrong in the midst of a culture that's completely chaotic. Kind of sounds a whole lot like ours, doesn't it? Kind of sounds a whole lot about our culture. And here's what God's saying. There's coming a day where my people won't be afraid. There's coming a day where they won't be terrified or they won't be missing. And he says that they will be saved and they will dwell securely. And we know the rest of the story, if you know scripture, is that the people didn't turn and the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom of all of Israel and the children of Israel were scattered all over the world into slavery. They were scattered all over because they didn't heed the call of God's righteousness. And they just did what they wanted to do. You see, we look at that culture and we go, man, why would they do that? I mean, why would they do that? And then we look at our own culture and I'm talking about Western theology. I'm not talking about the word, I'm talking about America. We look at our own culture we, go, we can't believe they did that. And yet in our own culture, we're redefining what is right and wrong, what's evil and good. Think about it. We're redefining it. And we think this is something new. See, here's what I know, that what we believe determines what we do. Not what you do determines what you believe. In fact, the reality is your beliefs, your values will shape your attitudes and your actions. So it's important to know what you believe and who measures what, whether it's right or wrong. Otherwise, it will end up like the book of Judges, the very last verse of the book of Judges, where it says, in that day, Israel had no king and people did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, they just decided what was right and wrong. They just redefined marriage. They just redefined what was going on. They just decided that men can sleep with who they want to and women can sleep with who they want to. They decided that they can do anything they want to with their resources. They've just decided, wait, am I talking about Israel or am I talking about today? See, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. We've even come to the place today that some people suggest that, 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 that it's neither right or wrong. We should just let the majority decide. Lord, help the poor, amen? Do we really want the majority to decide? See, here God is saying to his shepherds, he says, listen, guys, I'm the standard. In fact, I'm the standard which everything else is measured. Righteousness can be defined as a standard required for people to be acceptable to God. See, some of us, we continue to do what we want to do, thinking we're acceptable to God because we prayed a prayer one time, or we walked an aisle, or we got dunked and we got a bath, and we called it baptism, and yet there's been nothing changed in our journey, yet we still call ourselves followers of Jesus, yet if we examined our life out in public, outside of this building, and everything was exposed, all of a sudden we would discover that we are angry, mean, bitter, resentful, rude people. And there's no fruit of the Spirit in that. Last I checked. See, righteousness comes from God. So he defines what true righteousness is. And wrongness is understood by that which contradicts God's righteousness. And scripture pronounces a blessing on people who are serious about knowing the God of our righteous, the Jehovah righteous, the God of, of, of that he is the one who sets the standard. Jesus said this in Matthew 5 verse 6. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied. How many times do we do our, I mean, Danielle was so honest all ago about how many times we're not satisfied and we'll pursue everything but God's righteousness. And here's Jesus' promise. If you'll pursue my righteousness, you will be satisfied. I'll make a confession to you yesterday. I told you last week that God's done some work in this area of my journey. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a place where I, I'm, I feel like I'm heading in the right direction emotionally and spiritually and, and learning to repent on a regular basis. But two years ago, I told you that, God, sorry, we're going to hear. And, and yesterday, it started a week ago Friday, I'll be honest. A week ago Friday, I went and got my kids donuts. And they wanted some uh, donut holes. Now, honest confession, I've not eaten a donut in 18 months. 
And so I walked past the table and those donut holes were sitting there and I thought, ah, it's just one. And I popped it in my mouth and it was the most spiritual moment I've had in 18 months. I'm telling you, I was at the table just, oh, Lord. And that started a whole week. David Bright, the center youth pastor, brings donuts to staff meeting on Tuesday morning. Yeah, he's a sinner. He needs to confess. I don't know where he is, but he needs to confess. So I did what anybody would do. I didn't want to be an offense. So I cut a little slice off of a chocolate old-fashioned cake donut. <laughs> Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And then Saturday comes along, and, and I'm watching football. Did anybody see that Alabama beat down by LSU? Amen. Let's just take a moment and worship. Amen. Yes, Lord. Go Tigers. Anyway, um, and I'm neither a fan of either one. I just love to see Alabama beat. So yesterday I get up. And I tell Danielle all day long, I'm craving sugar. And instead of being righteous, I go to the cabinet and I know some of you have a beer fridge and some of you have a wine fridge. We have a candy cabinet in our house, amen? So I went to the candy cabinet, opened it up and I found a bag of lemon heads. My throat's kind of tightening up. So I looked at the back and it said, you know, only 50 grams of fat and calories and all that. And it says serving size 10. I said, okay, so I'll have 10. So I, so I sat down on the couch and 35 later, I'm counting them. Yeah, I just totally passed God's righteousness and went on past, amen. And all day long, I was laying in bed last night. And I was just like, oh. So here's what I know. You can go to the donut shop and you can get full. But nutritionally, it's wrong. Amen? Nutritionally, it's wrong. Because your body needs, needs the, those, those vitamins and minerals and those complex carbs and all those good stuff to thrive. Now, you, you can live on donuts for a season, but what's going to happen over time is you're not going to feel real good. You ever had too much of a good thing? Yeah, all of us have, hadn't we? Too much watermelon? <laughs> right? See, the principle holds true in our spiritual realm. When you fill up on reading novels and social media binging and watching TV and just talking to people to get what they're thinking and the world's perspective and, and you're always going, well, what do you think? And well, I don't know. And, and I'm going to read a little bit more and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a Facebook poll or maybe I'm going to check Twitter. Oh, I know, I'll Google because nobody Googles, right? What will happen is you'll lose your appetite and your hunger for God. Because the more you fill up on junk, the more you will cease to hunger and thirst for righteousness and, and therefore eliminate the care, the promise that he gave, the peace and the provision that comes from the Lord our righteousness. I mean, think about what's happened in our culture today. In our culture today, we have two political parties that are now determining what's right and wrong. And I'm not sure I agree with either one of them. Because last time I checked, God did not call me to worship a political party or a position or to say that I'm putting kings in place. There's only one king, and his name is Jesus. Again, we're talking about being whole here, and we're buying the lie of nationalism or being a good party member over what it means to follow the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that we are spiritually mature, emotionally mature, physically mature, that we are whole. I know you don't like that any more than I like it because let me tell you something. If I start reading Fox News or I start reading CNN or I start reading Independence or ABC or CBS or XYZ or whoever else, I'll tell you something, I get amped up. I'll get amped real quick. And all of a sudden I'll be mad at somebody I don't even know. I'll be talking to the TV to people that don't even know where I live. You see, God's kingdom, his worldview has been replaced with a man-made worldview. And there's some of us in the church, and I'm not talking about this church because none of you are this way, okay? I'm talking about the greater church that has believed a red or blue is more important than the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, Israel just traded their God for other gods. And our God today happens to be politics 
or money or addiction or a different, you fill in the blank. He is righteous and his viewpoint is righteous and any deviation from that leads to chaos. And let's be honest, living a life of righteousness is not always gonna feel good. It's not always gonna feel good. In fact, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness and the more righteousness you get in you, the more of the seed of righteousness that is in you and the more it grows, it's going to expose your sinfulness. It's going to expose your sinfulness that you have a choice to either reject God's standard or to repent and be whole. That's it. He cannot abide with sin. In fact, let me just go ahead and say this. I hadn't said this in a while. He will not bless sin. Would you say that with me? God will not bless sin. Say it again. God will not bless sin. Not even a little bit. And God tells us how he brings righteousness into his lives. Look at verse five. Because I'm gonna raise up for David a righteous branch and he'll reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. And this is that Old Testament verse, um, um, a prophecy about Jesus Christ coming. This is pointing, God's got the big picture in mind because many times this is about our picture right here. That's about our picture right here. And usually it's on whatever our issue is. And God says, I got something way bigger. I got something way bigger. And he begins to point towards Jesus, that Jesus came from the Davidic line as David's offspring, the prophecy of a coming Christ. It goes without saying that Jesus is the most unique human being that's ever lived on the face of earth, amen? Amen. I'm reading a book by John Elridge right now called A Beautiful Outlaw. And he was just that, a beautiful outlaw. I love it. No human male was involved in his conception. That Mary was fertilized by the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us that through this virgin birth, that deity infused humanity, that he was fully God and fully man. He didn't fake being human. He was hungry. He was lonely. He was tired. You ever faked being tired and then can't sleep all night? said Jesus passed out on a boat in a storm. He was fully human and fully God. Born without sin, lived for 33 years, hung on a cross to pay the penalty of sins for you and I. And after his death and burial and resurrection, that righteous branch fulfilled his intended purpose as Jehovah said canoe, our righteousness. He became the measuring point. He became the credit. In fact, the apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Said another way, the sin of humanity, yours and mine, was credited to Christ Jesus. In other words, he took credit for our sin. It was put on him. And because of the credit on him, the wrath of God attached to our sin was carried out and poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross. It should have been me. And it should have been you. But God took our sin and he credited it over to Jesus Christ. And just as our sin was credited to Jesus, his righteousness, I get this coach, his righteousness was credited to us. And we didn't do anything for it. He just said this, Jesus died and you get the benefits. Wow. That's good stuff. The beating, the nails, the brutality, the agonizing, all the things, the worst you can imagine was poured out on him for you and me. Listen, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven on credit. You ain't got two pennies of righteousness to rub together. You can't do it. You ain't got nothing. You're what we call in the car business a bogue. You can't finance bubble gum. Some of you will get that later. You ain't got any means. You either enter through the forgiveness of your sin, which comes through Jesus Christ, or you are separated from him for eternity in hell. Separated from the goodness of God. Our sin on him and his righteousness on us. And I know what some of you are thinking, okay, but what's that mean? 
I mean, this is, this is 2019. Well, imagine with me, you get a phone call in the morning that your bank teller at BTA, CNB, Southside, maybe Bank of America, maybe you have State Farm, maybe you have that, that bank that's now a cafe, which that doesn't even make sense to me. But anyway, um, imagine a teller calls you in the morning and says, we got great news. Sanders, we have great news. We just got a $100,000 deposit in your account. And, and not only that, hang on, hang on, hang on. Not only that, next month on this date, they're saying they're gonna put another 100 Gs in. And then the next month, and then the next month, and then the next month. And for the rest of your life, every month on this date, we're gonna deposit 100 Gs in your bank. You know what Rhonda and Alan Sanders would do? They'd start doing a dance in the Holy Ghost. Can I get an amen? They'd be doing the Humpty. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you. Some of you don't even know what the Humpty dance is. But anyway, they'd be dancing, man. Alan would have a new bass boat. Amen, come on. See, some of you are already dreaming of F-250. Oh, shoot, let's go 450, amen. Let's get the big one. <laughs> You'd be pulling that money. I tell you what, Danielle and I do. We go pull it out of the bank in case it's a mistake. Amen. <laughs> That's what we would be doing. We'd be yanking that out of there, right there. We're just we gonna put it in the safe to make sure it's good. Amen. Yeah. So let me tell you what happens. In the name of God, when it's credited to us, gives us a perfect credit score. Now, you may not have a perfect credit score in this world. My dad's one of the few guys that I've ever seen, one of the highest credit scores that I've ever seen in my life, and I sold cars for a long time. It's ridiculous, the man's credit score. It's ridiculous. In Jesus Christ, you have a ridiculous credit score. You have a ridiculous credit score. He not only gives you perfect credit in terms of your standing, he also allows you to make righteous withdrawals here on earth. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, as anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Let me tell you what that new things is. Look at 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not of something that's gonna die if you don't water, not of something that's it's not gonna make it. He says, no, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. The seed contains all you need in life for a life of righteousness. And his name is Jesus. You have everything in you already. In Christ, you're brand new. You're not the same person you used to, you were before. And when the moment you surrendered your life to Christ, the moment you realized your sin separated you from Jesus, and the moment you realized that all your sin was put on him, and if you would surrender your life to him, all his righteousness would be on you, there was a seed planted in you. There was a seed, and it's not a seed that's gonna die. It's a seed that's gonna grow because at that moment, not only is a seed implanted in you, the Holy Spirit fills you to begin to germinate that seed. Amen. And yet some of you are still doing what you did before because you're not allowing the seed to grow. You're listening to everybody else and what they think. You're listening to everything else in the world, in media, you see, there's several ways to feed and nourish that seed of righteousness planted in your spirit. Let me tell you the primary way. You ready for this? It's the word of God. It amazes me over and over and over again. I sit in my office and I listen to people and they look at me. And they want to say, I just want to grow. I just want the Lord. I just want, I want God. And I'll ask them, have you ever read the book of John? Where's that? Or No. And how many people have sat in church all their life and never read the word of God and claimed to know him? It's, it would be like me living with Danielle for 40 years and seeing her maybe once a month over that 40 years for 45 minutes, sometimes an hour and 20, depending on the preacher, amen? And then us going our separate ways and yet still claiming to be married, still claiming to know her and not know anything about her. And yet that defines some of our Christianity. You see, the apostle Paul says in Ephesians 4, 24, look at it. He says to put on, everybody say put on. Put on the new self, which is the likeness of God's been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Look at Romans 13, 14. Look what he says, put on. Everybody say put on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision. Hello. 
for the flesh. Some of you are making more provision for the flesh. No wonder the seed's not growing. In other words, every morning when you wake up, get dressed, put on Jesus, wear his righteousness. You go, Edward, how do you do that? I'll tell you how you do it. You start seeking to live within his standards. Not what the world says. Not, not what the government says, because you might lose this if you do that. Hello. What God says. What God says. That you view your life through his perspective. And as you continue to do this day by day, moment by moment, what happens is your mind is transformed. And that righteous seed, as you begin to saturate your heart with Scripture, and your mind, your emotions, the physical, the spiritual, repenting, what happens is it becomes second nature to make righteous decisions. Not on you, but based on him. So, how do you do this? Let's go back to that first question that I started with. In regard to everything in your life, what is God's view on blank? And you fill in the blank. Say, I don't know all your situations. I, I, I don't know what you're facing. Some of you, you have job issues. You have parenting issues. Some of you are having affairs. What does God say about that? See, some are not so clear because I, I don't think God really has just, the, you know, you, if you don't take this job, you're in sin. If you take that job, I think there's a lot of freedom there. But listen, when it comes to evil, affairs, stealing, if there's in doubt, just go back to the, to the Ten Commandments and take a look, okay? Just begin to ask yourself, God, what's your view on this? And when you get God's view, act on it. If you want to grow in righteousness, you got to hang out with him. And then you got to hang out with other people who are growing in righteousness. And I'm not talking about never hanging out with sinners because I love hanging out with sinners. Amen? They're a whole lot more fun than church people sometimes. I'll be honest. I'm just saying this. I know this for a fact. You'll become like those you spend the majority of your time with. And you can't hang out with the wrong people and expect to have a right life. Let me say this again. You can't hang out with the wrong people and expect to have a right life. That's why we believe in small groups. Having a group of people around you that are living righteousness, that live in the same direction. And I would challenge you, if you want to grow in righteousness, and start surrounding yourself with those. So let me close with this. Because I know some of you are sitting there going, yeah, but Edward, you don't understand. I can never be whole. I can never be righteous because you don't understand what I've done emotionally. And Edward, if you only knew what I've done physically, there's no way God can forgive me. This, this is so powerful. I didn't get to this in the first service. And I've changed everything to get to this because this is so powerful. Because look at Jeremiah 23, verse 8. This is so good. Now, remember, God's introducing his righteousness, right? He says, they will say, as the Lord lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the Northland and from all the countries where I'd driven them out, then they will live on their own soil. Now, now, th this is strong. Some of you think you're way too far gone, that God could never restore. God brought the Israelites, remember the North Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, they all got put into slavery, they got spread all over the world. Here's what happened. The Israelites lost their culture. They lost their language. They were scattered all over the world. Israel stopped being a nation in AD 70. And in May of 1948, God brought Israel back to their own land. Do you know we're the first generation over the last 75 years to see that fulfilled? Now, now this is interesting. He brought them back to their own land and he reestablished them in nation, as a nation. And no other country in history has ceased to be a nation, been scattered worldwide, and then brought back thousands of years later to become a nation again without having lost their language or culture in between. <laughs> he preserved Israel just as he said. And so listen to me. If God could put Israel back together after thousands of years, right? 
And if he can bring an entire country dispersed and disbanded all over the world and he can bring them back to their land, surely he can handle your screw up. Amen. Come on. Yeah. I, I, I'm just telling you. When I read that this week, I said, whoa. I don't know who was welcoming me to the 20th century, but somebody was. Uh, telephone, that's a cool ring. I don't, y'all need to send me that. Um, it's just so cool. And he can take pieces. I, I remember when we went to Israel, and, and they were talking about all the different, and they were talking about Ethiopian Jews. I'm going, do what? That's how scattered they got and intermarried and all that. And God brought them back together. But it was based on his standard and his righteousness. And if you and I will pursue his righteousness, guess what he'll do? He'll strengthen you and he'll reconstruct chaos into beauty. And it's going to hurt. And it's going to be painful. In fact, I, I'm going to say this for the third week in a row. Totally made up. This number is. completely made up number but I believe 99.3% of the issues in your life go back to unforgiveness Amen. That's right. That's exactly right. it's a made up number it, it may be 99.9 it, it may be 100% <laughs> the reason some of you don't live up and that seed's not growing is because you won't let go of what somebody did to you a mom, a dad, a tragedy, a divorce, a first marriage, a kid, a boss, a church. It's wounded you. And you keep hanging on. Well, they deserve it. I tell you, you search long enough, you'll find somebody to agree with you that they deserve whatever you think they deserve. Right? Well, I just think they need to pay. And yet God's word says to forgive. If you don't forgive your brother, then he ain't going to forgive you. Yeah, but Edward, they deserve it. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And then you go find five other people and go, you know what, they do deserve it. And all of a sudden it validates and it's still wrong. Amen? All right, so does that hurt enough? Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you that, um, one, you don't play games. You're a God who is pure and righteous. You're a God who relates. You're, 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 <laughs> you're a God who pursues us. God, I'm so grateful for that. So, Father, I pray today that as we walk out of this place, everything we do this week and the decisions we make and the mornings we wake up, that, God, we would just begin to ask ourselves, God, what do you think about this? And then, God, we would line our emotions and our physical and our spiritual, just that integrity, head, heart, and body, up with your standard through Jesus Christ. And Father, as you expose sin, as you have in some today, it's painful because we don't want to let go. We don't want to let go of that affair. We don't want to let go of that anger or that bitterness because it gives us a reason to live. And yet, God, in living, what we think is living is really just death, separate from your goodness, that when we pursue your righteousness, peace. So God, give us courage to confess sin and repent today and this week and next week and next week as we just withdraw from your account, your righteousness, and we put that on every day. So Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. As we respond, I pray you'd bless it. As we take communion, Lord, and go to that table that you prepared with your body and blood, should have been us, but you took our sin upon you. And you died and you rose again, conquering death, hell, and the grave. The only one to ever pull off, predict and pull off his death and resurrection. His name is Jesus. We worship you. We surrender to you. We take this communion today of worship, longing for the day you return. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. And we ask it in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said. 
Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.